beloved by the poet Edgar Allan Poe and many others, Fort Monroe stands guard at the entrance to the beautiful and magnificent Chesapeake Bay. For more than 400 years, the federal government has been the sole steward of what is today Fort Monroe. But that stewardship is ending. The Department of Defense and the BRAC Commission have ordered this active army base in Hampton, Virginia, closed by 2011. And that makes Fort Monroe the subject of a passionate debate to be decided by the state-appointed Fort Monroe Federal Area Development Authority, or FADA. The future of this historic site and the fort itself hangs in the balance. It was many and many a year ago, in a kingdom by the sea, that a maiden there lived, whom you may know, by the name of Annabel Lee. This maiden, she lived with no other thought than to love and be loved by me. I was a child, and she was a child, in this kingdom by the sea. But we loved with a love that was more than love. I and my Annabel Lee, with a love that the winged seraphs of heaven coveted her and me. And this was the reason that long ago in this kingdom by the sea, a wind blew out of a cloud chilling my beautiful Annabel Lee, that her high-born kinsman came and bore her away from me and shut her up in a sepulchre in this kingdom by the sea. Fort Monroe has been part of our national history since 1609 until uh, the present day. It's part of our military history, our social history. It has a particularly rich Civil War history. Um, it's a phenomenal place in terms of architectural history, engineering history. It really is essential to understanding American history. Captain John Smith first saw it and he thought it was a special place, fit for a castle and he was responsible for having it fortified in 1609 to protect Jamestown. It was obvious to the uh, original colonists that establishing some sort of a watch post uh, at Old Point Comfort uh, was absolutely necessary. They wanted to know in advance at Jamestown of any enemy fleet that might approach the Chesapeake Bay. There's no place you could find on the face of the earth with such magnificent waterways. And of course Chesapeake Bay is the largest estuary in the world. It was teeming with fish and crab and ducks and gulls and eggs and everything. It was a, it was a fecund place for them to come. Fort Algernon will be washed away in one of the periodic hurricanes that, that hit this region. Uh, later in the mid-1700s, uh, they will build Fort George. Now, Fort George was a lot more substantial of a, of a structure. It was constructed out of brick and believed to be fairly strong, but it too washed away in a hurricane. It was a major, major tsunami. And after that, they didn't build for a while. Intermittently, there would be these periods where there was no fortification. But th they always came back to it because of its strategic importance. Fort Monroe was built after the War of 1812. The burning of Washington was a national disgrace. We didn't like it, so we hired this French military engineer named Brigadier General Simon Bernard, and he will design the largest mode encircled 
stone fortification ever built in the United States. And of course, it's named Fort Monroe in honor of the then president, James Monroe. With Washington burned, with Baltimore nearly destroyed, and the whole Chesapeake Bay terrorized by the British, then Congress authorized this fortress that would be impregnable at the mouth of the bay, guarding the Chesapeake. And there are lots of other things to say about the history, including the presence of Black Hawk and Edgar Allan Poe, and General Lee helped to build the fortress, and Abraham Lincoln stood on a rampart and looked at the battle. Those are all notable things, but in my opinion, the most important historical thing about Fort Monroe is that, as Professor Engs says, it's the place where American slavery began to die, and the place where liberty for all Americans finally, truly began. The story of the transformation of the Civil War from a war for union to a war for emancipation essentially begins in, in Hampton, Virginia at Fort Monroe. Um, it really was considered a backwater in 1861. And as a consequence, Abraham Lincoln sent a very political uh, Democratic general named Benjamin Butler uh, down to Fort Monroe. Um, he had caused trouble and nearly led to uh, Maryland seceding from the Union. He was so heavy-handed there. Uh, Lincoln anticipated nothing would happen at Fort Monroe, uh, so he sent Butler to keep him out of trouble. And of course, uh, something entirely different than that uh, occurred. The evening of May 23rd, Three slaves belonging to Charles King Mallory, who was a prominent attorney here in Hampton, by the way, he had sent his slaves to Sewell's Point to work on the Confederate battery. They escaped from Sewell's Point and made their way to Fort Monroe. Uh, Lincoln hadn't yet decided what uh, his policy on slavery was. His uh, basic stance, as he said to Horace Greeley, was that if I can free all the slaves and save the Union, I would do that. If I can save the Union and free none of the slaves, I'll do that. If I can free some of the slaves and thereby save the Union, I'll do that. So Butler, uh, the consummate politician, uh, saw an opportunity to take advantage of these three uh, brave fugitives and decided to, to uh, declare that they were contraband of war. It's told as if General Butler uh, was the hero of the story for his uh, ad admittedly clever um, decision about calling these people property and therefore contraband and therefore a thing that couldn't be given back to the enemy. But these people were not a thing. They were Frank Baker, James Townsend, and Shepard Mallory, the first three contrabands who came. And in my opinion, they're the heroes of the story, they and the thousands who came after them. Actually, he promoted a law which was the, the, the Confiscation Act of August the 6th, 1861, which decreed any Union officer could confiscate slaves thought to be working in the rebellion with the rebels. Thousands of slaves throughout the South ran to get behind Union lines to become contraband. So by calling them contraband, he avoided the real question of whether they were slave or free but it gave him an excuse not to return them to their master when he came to, uh, to, to claim them. In fact, Butler said, well, as soon as you, you know, take, a, take an oath to support the Union, uh, I would be obligated to give them back to you. He knowing full well that the master was already a Confederate officer and had no intention of, of pledging allegiance to the Union. General Butler told John Kerry, he said, well, John, since um, Virginia has now seceded from the state and because they have now declared themselves as foreigners, our federally constituted laws don't apply to foreigners. So he didn't really have anybody to give them back to. And with that, um, more slaves started coming to Hampton to get behind Union lines. And in fact, 10,000 ran to get behind Union lines at Fort Monroe. They came from Shirley, Berkeley, Friendly, Westover, Carter's Grove. They came 200 miles out of North Carolina. They came from Norfolk, Portsmouth, Princess Anne, Grayson, Nanceman, York counties. If they could just get there, they were going to be free. And that's why they called it 
the Freedom's Fortress. By the end of the war, 20,000 African American uh, former slaves had settled in and around Fort Monroe and in the ruins of the burned city of, of, of Hampton. The slaves, in finding and fighting for their own liberation, liberated our nation. The story of, of Fort Monroe and of Hampton is in fact a positive one of, of, of the promise of America finally reaching uh, another major segment of its, of its population, the, the African American population. Um, and it's a story that should be told in a, in, in a setting that's, that's, that's conducive, not um, as has happened to so many Civil War battlefields and things, that they've disappeared under uh, commercial development. The hit on the city of Hampton is a minus 7% in our budget. <clears throat> it's going to have the effect on the peninsula from what we're told by the Hampton Roads Planning District. The closing of Monroe will have the financial hit on the peninsula as if the College of William Murray were to close. <laughs> Uh, FADA came out of an initiative on the part of uh, the part of the city of Hampton to try to uh, make ourselves more useful in the fight to keep Fort Monroe uh, an army post. Commonwealth of Virginia General Assembly actually created a FADA in advance of BRAC and so Hampton was far ahead in the process and the army was very very impressed by that and how they would be able to work with them very easily and move forward. And then, of course, the bottom drops out. Monroe is on the list. That's exactly the way we had heard it was going to be. All the rumors came true, all the innuendos and so forth, etc. The clock has started and will not be restarted unless uh, Congress, can, you know, again, convenes and decides to, to do something like that. But uh, odds of that are very small. So the clock has begun. During the BRAC uh, closure, operations that were going on in 1993, Fort Moreau was initially put on the list by the by the Pentagon. And Senator Warner, then for Senator, came out and publicly said, we can't close Fort Monroe because if we did, we would have to make it a national park. And subsequently the Secretary of the Army took Fort Monroe off of the closure list. That wasn't the only reason, but uh, certainly that was one of the factors. And it wasn't closed. In the last round of BRAC closures in the early 90s, when I was living at Fort Monroe, I remember so clearly the day that the BRAC folks came to visit Fort Monroe. And um, Mellon Street that leads into the fort was just absolutely jam-packed with people with signs saying, Save Fort Monroe. And, and I actually got tears in my eyes because you know I felt so strongly about it and was so concerned about its closing. So um, it really struck me the next time the Brack people came this, this round, I went down to Mellon Street and nobody was there. The, the process prior to this had always been that the Department of Army, who wanted to keep Fort Monroe open in previous years, would give you that information and that insight on what you needed to say to convince the Army not to put it on the list. And you were able to do that and you had this inside working. At the same time, you may recall in previous years, the Daily Press was very big on keeping Monroe open, even to the point that they had a flag on the top with the seal of Monroe, and it said, save our fort. None of that existed during this process. We certainly gave a lot of room in our pages for people to express their opinion on Fort Monroe. I, if you went back and looked at our op-ed pages and our letters, there have been many people who've, so, you know, who've spoken out on Fort Monroe. So to that extent, I think we really were a, a facilitator. Anybody who's been watching knows that there have been lots of politics around Fort Monroe. And you have the local government with a stake in the future of that, that place, um, the state government with the reversionary rights, and of course the, the federal government with its stewardship responsibilities. The, the worst case at Fort Monroe would be uh, what I think we were threatened with two years ago, a little li bit less so now, and that would have just been turning it into Condo City. I don't think that's going to happen now. I think though that there's a grave danger still of Fort Monroe becoming what I like to call, what, what we like to call a gated community without the gate. Our office has assisted uh, the, the LRA, the City of Hampton, the Commonwealth with that reuse planning piece, that, that uh, redevelopment plan, if you will, 
that the consultants had put together. Uh, they've done a lot of work. Uh, it's a great plan. I think you can probably find it on their website. It's in draft form, and it's, it's, it's something that's really going to help uh, the community plan its way through this. And, and our office, uh, Department of Defense, had helped uh, prepare them, had helped bring in those consultants and help fund that project. No, 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 there was never any conversation of a national park or a state park. It's what can we build and where can we build and how much can we build? Well, there was talk, uh, there was some talk about national park, but the main talk about it was to, um, uh, to say, oh yes, that would be a good, uh, that would be a great idea to have a national park, but it's not feasible. And that was the position that uh, Hampton took and that was what was posted on the Hampton website. The National Park Service knocked my socks off by saying, we don't want it. Well, I assume they don't want to cut somebody else's grass and they're going to take that approach. Then they tell us, first time I hear this figure, we're $630 million a year in the hole. They do not have the money to maintain that property. Now, they said, if you give us this property, the first thing we'll have to do in 2011 is padlock the gate. And certainly the National Park Service did not take an official position on it because they're not allowed to. And it's a political decision. It takes political leaders and political will to form a national park. The folks that were advocating for a National Park Service, uh, if I would have selected a group to go off and advocate for me, they'd have been the last folks I'd ever selected. And I, and I don't mind saying that. They're the most, uh, I mean, it was their way or no way. A lot of groups have, you know, put down, I guess is the youth term that we use, um, put down other groups. But there is a secret agreement between the state and Hampton uh, for what they're going to do with the Fort Monroe and essentially it does involve privatizing. And to kind of portray Hampton City Hall as seven city council members who are trying to line their pockets, who are trying to, you know, turn this into some, you know, fiefdom and playground for them is just, it's not true and it's not accurate. This isn't about a wrestling match. This is about our pulling together and finding a good future for Fort Monroe. It's not necessarily a, a peninsula asset or a, or a Hampton asset. It's a, it's a regional asset. And so it's not just the historic buildings themselves that need to be preserved, but it's the historical landscape, the historical natural landscape that exists out there. If you destroy the context of that 19th century fort, you've destroyed the historical landmark. I think the most problematic issues is how we fund the 15 million or more dollars to make sure that the original fort is properly maintained. And that's what everyone's struggling with. The Commonwealth of Virginia would have a tough time just taking that out of pocket. The city of Hampton, it would be impossible to add that kind of money to their budget. And we know at the federal level that the National Park Service is very strained at the services they provide and, and we hear about that all the time. Immediately we need to look at the environmental cleanup. Um, that does not uh, yet have a price tag on it. I mean they heard estimates going up to one billion dollars for ordinance cleanup. So you had a lot, of, a lot of fear about that. Now we're hearing estimates closer to 300 million, 250. You never know. I mean, it's, it, they've got a lot more sort of exploratory stuff to do, but I think a lot of the reason they kept it from being closed was because of the fear of how much it would cost to clean the base up. It's, it's up to the Army to make sure that, that they clean up this property and, and, and properly convey that then to the, uh, to the city and or to the state. But again, the money is the issue, as it is in government. I mean, here we were fighting a war in Iraq, and the kids were riding around in Humvees that didn't have bulletproof stuff on the bottom for the bombs. We're actively engaged in Iraq and Afghanistan right now, and we want to take care of the folks that are over there. So we don't want to turn that into a national park and then lock the gate. And that is my fear as mayor. I cannot afford to lock that gate. Virginia, we've got Mount Vernon, 
we've got Monticello. Um, these are National Historic Landmarks. That's where Fort Monroe ranks. It is priceless. It's unique. It's irreplaceable. And it's our responsibility here in 2007 to see that it's preserved for the future. The characteristics of Fort Monroe are going to dictate, in a lot of ways, the future of Fort Monroe. And I think that's a positive thing for anyone who's involved, for anyone who's watching it. For reuse planning and for implementation stages as we move closer to that 2011 date, it would make things a lot easier on the folks locally, a lot easier on the Army, a lot easier on the Commonwealth of Virginia if that reuse planning can take place with one steward. If you have multiple stewards, inevitably you have uh, differences of opinion and infighting. You also raise the potential that at least one of the stewards may not have the same vision for the place as what we thought everyone was signing on to. One possible blueprint for the future is the Presidio in San Francisco. However, the uniqueness again of the Presidio, the uniqueness of Fort Monroe will not allow you to basically take that Presidio, put an overlay on top of Fort Monroe and say, okay, that's what we want to do. Now, it's the other coast, it's a different setting, but it's the management entity there called the Presidio Trust, which deserves our very close attention. This is a federally chartered uh, management entity. It's a for-profit entity, which is responsible for preserving the historic resources and managing the construction of any potential new buildings on the site. And there already has been some new construction out there. The Presidio got $30 million when it was closed and told that they had to become self-sufficient within 15 years. But we need not mold ourselves into the Presidio pattern. We should learn from it. The first real, the real question is, what is the best use of the piece of land? And if you determine that question and, and a national park is the answer, hey, that would be great. Uh, but there might be some hybrid or some other answer, and we need to be open to that. We're at the exact same kind of juncture that the ladies who saved Mount Vernon were facing in the 1850s. Um, and it's our responsibility to see it through. It should be a regular town. So if we've got to do something, I would like to see a winery go in there. I would like to see Donald Trump come in and take old Fort Monroe. Like the commercial says, it's priceless. But you could think of making Fort Monroe a place for people to come and have weddings. Have an amphitheater at Fort Monroe. So let's hope global warming hasn't made it an island. I'd like to see national sculling championships on Mill Creek if it's long enough. <laughs> a battle between the Merrimack and Monitor. Once you get to the Officers Club, that's always been a resort area and I think we should remake it as a resort area. It's a great opportunity for heritage tourism. Important businesses, think tanks. The office complexes of a clean nature, high-tech type activity. It could be a wonderful national park. Where else could you go to the beach on your bicycle while your husband may walk through the Casemate Museum or your children explore a, a trail? People long for a, a vista that's not crowded, either with amusements or with signs saying you ought to see this, you ought to see that. We want to explore every possibility for Fort Monroe. People would get so emotionally involved in this that all of a sudden if you didn't think exactly the way they thought, if your gear didn't mesh, then you were becoming the enemy. And people do that when they become so spirited in what, they're, in, in what, they, what they believe in. Uh, I'm sorry too for, this, for the stuff that I might have said that was um, contemplated or calculated in the wrong way and the important thing to do now is to talk about what's to happen in the future. Let's have the National Park people. Let's have the city people pushing for the new urbanist village. Let's have everybody at the same table talking through. You start off with a proposition of you want to preserve the historic structures and you want to preserve as much open space and public access as you can. But you also want to find the economic activity that will allow you to do both of those things. That will guarantee the future of Fort Monroe. Someone in the National Park Service said in response to a question, well, don't we have some coastal forts already represented in the National Park System? He said we do, but if you put all of them together, they would not add up to the same value as Fort Monroe itself provides.
Oh gosh, it's absolutely priceless. It's so rich in history. It is a resource that is, as I've said, essential to understanding our journey. Now in the end, a choice is gonna to have to be made. And the future of Fort Monroe has to take into account the extraordinary historic significance here. And it has to take into account economics. What's it gonna to cost to maintain this place into the future? And we have only one shot to get it right. We need to just give this the time to make the right decision because we'll live with this decision a long time um, and so it's important that we get it right. This is a place that is central in American history, especially in, in African American history and it should be preserved as such and celebrated as such. And its upkeep should be so generously and freely given by this nation. There should be no question about it. It is a symbol so deep of what the meaning of America is that it has no price and no value any more than the sea and the sky does.